I am a 27-year-old film, theater, and writing passionate person. I'm a person who enjoys three things, a good meal, a good film, and the accompaniment of good people. And that can be achieved anytime I'm around my friends or my family. As long as we're together, I'm happy. It doesn't matter what we're doing, really. My friends and I are guys that have a very set amount of things that we like to do. Movies and music, that's what we all love to do. And if we're not doing that, then we're just hanging around, having a good drink and just chatting it up. We'll always have a good time just talking. It's all about having fun, and as long as we have fun, it's, that's the main mission. My name is Jeffrey, and I have Asperger's Syndrome. It is a higher functioning, uh, milder form of autism. I work at the Bob Rumbell Canadian Center of Excellence for the Deaf. I'm the Sign Language Services Coordinator, and I'm responsible for the sign language programs taught at the center. I also teach ASL at Humber College, as well as teach an ASL workshop for first responders. Outside of work, I love spending time with my friends. We enjoy traveling, going to the movies, sporting events, or just visiting each other in our homes. When I'm with my family, it usually turns into a big event with other families and friends getting together with us. It's always lots of fun, and there's always lots to do. My name is Lisa Feria. I was born in Canada. I identify as being deaf, although I was born hard of hearing. Uh, I'm uh, just a regular guy. I like sports. I go to a lot of baseball games, a lot of hockey games, uh, play sports when I have an opportunity to. Um, uh, I like to learn. You know, every day is a new challenge. Uh, I taught high school for 10 years and then I spent uh, almost 11 years working as sales manager for Panasonic. Um, my brothers and sister live in California, so I am the only one here looking after my mom. She's in a nursing home. She's suffering from a little bit of dementia right now, and uh, I'm there to support her in any way that I can. Uh, and family is very important to me. My name is Raymond Hay. Um, I've suffered from bipolar and depression for the last 20 odd years. Uh, I'm 61 years of age right now. I'm a qualified teacher. I've been teaching for 12 years. Uh, I live with my husband and my dog Jelly, being Minkus. I like to take my dog for walks. She keeps me going for sure. She's a bubble of energy. I'm very creative, so I like being artsy and stuff. I'm able to make music on my computer, um, like music producing. I'm really good at that. I used to paint. I painted a lot last year. Basically, I believe in karma. What goes around comes around. Be a good person. Be a gentle, generous, helpful person on a daily basis and that's how people should be. I'm Abby, I have a brain injury, a mild to moderate brain injury, and I have mental illness um, on top of that, which I've always had uh, in my life, but the brain injury has amplified it, so I'm noticing more borderline personality disorder. I was the odd one. I was uh, the uh, kid who would quote movies as a way of interacting. Of course, that would only get me so far. When people would pick on me, I just never knew how to talk things down. I would just shove them away. Very physical. Got me into trouble a lot. So I had a, a bit of a temper. Who would want to be friends with the person who would fly off the rails? I wouldn't. Everybody kept their distance. But as the years have progressed and I've started to work more on my social skills and I've had a lot of people who have coached me on my social abilities, my vice principal in 
high school. Anytime I was feeling upset, I could go in and see her. I credit most of my social turnaround to her help. The second was due to a social club that was started off up for people with um, social difficulties to come together and we could just talk about whatever. The summer camp was probably the biggest help of all. Camp Kodiak is a summer retreat uh, for kids of all types of disabilities, social impairments. Um, I was sitting in a uh, group having a talk with a bunch of other campers and I mentioned that I had Asperger's syndrome and three quarters of the group put up their hand. And when I realized that I wasn't the only person in the group who had it, it allowed me to open up. Once that happened, I didn't have fears of talking to people anymore. Probably improved my social skills so much so that it's taught me patience. It's taught me to see things from other people's perspectives. If it weren't for that camp, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. The dream is to be able to tell people that I have Asperger's. I had hard times, really hard times. I almost didn't make it, but I pushed and pushed and pushed and I broke through. Communication is important for me, as it is for other deaf people. We live in a hearing world and often wonder what's going on around us. Growing up, we often missed out on so much of our family activities because we couldn't share moments, we couldn't share information as much as we would have liked because of the communication issue. And even today, I know I miss a lot of what goes on around me. I wish I could access 100% of the communication in the hearing environment, but I'm just not able to. And that causes concern. A small thing to hearing people can be a big issue for deaf people. For example, most buildings have some sort of public announcement system that informs people if there's a situation they need to know about. But rarely are these messages visually displayed. So how is a deaf person to know what is happening and what to do if there were an emergency? We should be able to access this information right away, the same as hearing people do. We also encounter many hearing people who think that those who are deaf can't do a number of things simply because they can't hear. This is particularly true when seeking employment. Many employers won't hire a deaf person because they see them as just being deaf and they think they can't do the job. But we are people, the same as anyone else. We're good at anything we want to do. It's just that we don't hear. We depend on seeing, we depend on sight, but we can do anything. When I got ill, I was a workaholic, uh, not realizing that uh, the bipolar system was, um, was taking over. I thought that it was a normal kind of thing, and finding out that I was bipolar, which was hard for me, because I had no idea what bipolar, I had no idea what depression was all about. I, I, you know, it was something all new to me. You know, and, uh, it was one of the most devastating things I've ever been through in my life because I didn't, I didn't know how to accept it. I didn't know where my life was going. And I thought that, you know, this was it, it was all over. And actually, to tell you the truth, I, you know, you're kind of saying, you know, am I, am I better off uh, dead and not going through this thing? You know, and that was, that was the hardest thing for me. So I think once you get into a routine and you understand the routine, it makes a big difference in your health. My routine that keeps me uh, is first and foremost taking my medication. That's number one. Number two, I come to Progress Place um, seven days a week. Progress Place is basically psychosocial rehabilitation. So members um, and staff work in partnership in the running of the clubhouse. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to be involved and not 
thinking that your life is over and there's nothing else that you can do. We kind of know what each other are going through when you're, when you're ill and we support one another. It's just having somebody really care about each other. It sure helped me, you know, in, in, in my struggles and, and my life. Uh, nobody's ever cured. You know, the, the idea of thinking that if you, if you take medication for a week or for a month that it's going to cure. Every single day it is a struggle. You know, you're going to have setbacks where things happen and you have no control over it. It is the illness. It's how you deal with it, how you try and stay on that, that line that uh, says, okay, today is maybe not the greatest day, but I know how to deal with it now. So having that standard routine is, is very important. And that's what keeps me going every day. My mental health and my brain injury uh, can make me very emotional, very sensitive, very aggressive. I have severe anxiety, panic attacks, um, PTSD. It's, it's devastating. I, I'm totally, I can't teach anymore. I can't think, I can't organize my thoughts, I can't process, everything just comes overwhelming. I'm just, I get frustrated because I'm not who I am and I hate it. Our emotions are more sensitive with borderline personality disorder and we react immediately without thinking or being mindful. I constantly have um, this tornado of thoughts and it's almost like a possession like you're being attacked with these dark thoughts. And then my head hurts and gets like a really bad cramp here. And then I just lose it. It's like, I'm not even the same person. Mostly I hurt myself, but I can also hurt other people. And I don't think of the consequences when I do it. Yeah, it's hard for people to understand that because they just think you're a little punk acting out. And I get a lot of that stigma. I'm tired of feeling this way. And this isn't sometimes, this is most of the time. So it's a, it's a lot of emotion and dealing with stuff, brain injury, and on top of mental illness is, it's, it's like a tornado for me. So I have to kind of keep the tornado from forming in my life daily. So I try to live a normal daily life that I can. My husband has been very good support as well. I have good family support. Um, they're still trying to understand my brain injury and, men and mental health. Um, it's really hard. My parents are like, that's not her, what's going on? And you completely change after an, an accident, a traumatizing accident. And um, I'm just trying to find myself again. Um, I don't know what my next career is gonna be, but I hope it's soon. I just want to do something with my life. If uh, the officer wanted to uh, get as much information out of me as possible, I suppose it would be important for me to let him know that I have Asperger's and it might be difficult for me to get words out at that moment, but I wouldn't be perfectly coherent. I would probably be straining myself for words and I may or may not be forming perfect sentences. I have to really think to uh, get my answer out. The answer wouldn't come as naturally. A lot of the time I am worrying if I am saying exactly the right thing. I'm a bit of a perfectionist and not being able to do that at exactly the right moment can cause me a little bit of stress. <laughs> so if it's especially for someone of a relative amount of importance, like a police officer, it would probably cause me a fair deal of stress. And hopefully they would uh, be able to understand in that context that I'm going through a little bit of an issue at the time. Just be patient with us, I implore you, and as long as you don't yell at us, we won't shut down. I would just say if the police officer just allowed me to take my time, just say, just keep breathing, just allow me to collect my thoughts, my thoughts and um, let my thought process come to a good point where I can 
explain the situation and uh, we can get to the point where it's beneficial to the both of us. This is the mind of an Asperger's person going. <laughs> When I approach a police officer and begin to interact, don't be afraid of me. Be willing to communicate with me. Give me eye contact. And if we don't understand one another, let's write back and forth. We can use your phone as text to text back and forth or whatever technology is available. Let's use it. Maintaining eye contact with a deaf person is important. Don't look away from them. And don't put your hand over your mouth. Seeing your face and your expression helps them to understand you. And don't shout at them. They're deaf. You don't need to shout. If the deaf person is able to understand you, speak slowly and clearly, and just enunciate normally. Don't exaggerate your speech. Having as normal an interaction as possible will calm the deaf person down and allow them to know what is going on instead of being left in the dark. If the officer knows a bit of sign language, inform the deaf person of this, and they will accommodate to your level of signing ability. But for any conversation at a more detailed level, you need to hire an interpreter. But it needs to be a qualified interpreter. And then, through the interpreter, you can have a more in-depth conversation. I witnessed your mobile crisis team downtown uh, working with somebody that was going through a, a crisis downtown, and I thought it was handled so well, having the officer and that psychiatric nurse working in partnership with that individual, I think the empathy that you have to have for somebody that's going through that as from a police officer's st standpoint is, is having that empathy and trying not to, to make that person feel worse than they feel already. That's, a, that's the most important thing is saying, you know, don't worry about it. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to embarrass you or make you feel guilty about having that setback. To be able to calm somebody down and say, okay, listen, you know, I, I understand that you're, you, what are you going to, what can I do, how can I, how can I help you? Sometimes when somebody uh, is not well and they're, they're struggling to give you an answer, you have to slow it down to say, okay, what's your name? Where do you live? If you need time to think about it, think about it. Give them that opportunity just to calm down. You know, don't be in such a rush to get all the answers at, at once. I would like to know that that, that officer is going to take the time and maybe realize what I'm going through is, is a struggle. When the police arrive, I've had um, most, most cases have been pretty good. And they'll come in um, and just, just talk to me, just kind of trying to bring me back to reality, kind of like, because I'm, I'm so out of it, it's just trying to get people to calm down and, and uh, distracted. So say, okay, how are you gonna come back? Like, how are you gonna focus? Say one to two things or one to three things to me very general point form and I'll get it. Keep repeating, repetition is really important too. If I hear it once, it's not gonna work. I have to hear something maybe five or 10 times for it to register or for me to fully comprehend it. So as long as the officers are trying to bring me back into reality, make me focus on them, keep me grounded as much as they can, and it won't happen right away. Sometimes it's like two hours till I'm, I'm with it. You don't have to care about that person, but just have sensitivity and we do hear you. Like, even if you're whispering or you're outside of our room and we're at the hospital, I still hear you. <laughs> I don't like to be told I'm a waste of time or that they have other things to do, better things. That hurts. So just having that sensitivity, that nurturing, being kind and patient, because I'll be kicking and screaming for a good 20 minutes, but I still need that person to be like patient until I get grounded or focused. And until, until that person's grounded or focused, we're not gonna get anywhere. While our disabilities may be invisible, we are not. Look beyond these disabilities and see us.